السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على سيدنا ونبينا وحبيب قلوبنا وقائدنا وشفيعنا أبي القاسم المصطفى محمد وعلى أهل بيته الطيبين الطاهرين المعصومين المنتجبين الغر الميامين صلى الله عليك يا سيدي ويا مولاي يا رسول الله صلى الله عليك يا سيدي ويا مولاي يا أبا عبد الله يا رحمة الله الواسعة ويا باب نجاة الأمة ويا عبرة كل مؤمن ومؤمنة يا ليتنا كنا معكم سادتي فنفوز فوزا عظيما أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم كل نفس بما كسبت رهينة إلا أصحاب اليمين في جنات يتساءلون عن المجرمين ما سلككم في سقر قالوا لم نك من المصلين ولم نكن نطعم المسكين وكنا نخوض مع الخائضين وكنا نكذب بيوم الدين حتى أتانا اليقين فما تنفعهم شفاعة الشافعين عطروا مجالسكم بالصلاة على محمد وآل محمد Our age has been characterized by mass communication The dominant Phenomena and feature of this age and time is mass communication and information and advanced technology. And our life, we have been so obsessed by technology and information and communication means and instruments that we cannot part with them. If I ask you today, sisters and brothers about what is the closest thing to you and what is the most important thing to you I'm sure most of you are going to tell me this which is the cell phone I'm sure that most of you today are carrying this including me in our pockets in fact in some economies in some cultures the level of success and economic Prosperity and affluence is measured by the number of the cell phones that people have. Even in some countries, people as young as seven and eight years old, they carry it with them. After that comes the computer, the PC, the laptop, that you have it at home. And after that, the TV. And all these things are instruments and communication devices. Our life has been so dependent 
on communication that if we lose them one day, our life will be shattered, will collapse. I remember a few years ago in America, we had a problem with the satellite communication for maybe three or four hours only. Life collapsed. People were disturbed. Their businesses disrupted. Millions, rather hundreds of millions of dollars were lost because of a brief interruption in communication. Our life is dependent today entirely and totally on communication between each other. Tonight, I want to talk about a different type of communication. Communication between us and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And that is the salat, vital communication for us. Without it, our life is going to be completely shattered. We cannot survive. As-salatu amudu al-deen. In qubilat, qubila ma siwaha wa in ruddat, rudda ma siwaha. The prayers is the very first step of faith. The solid foundation of religion is the salat. Every act of worship depends on your prayers. If your prayers are safe, you know, when you go to college, you have a, a major, you choose a major, chemistry, psychology, English. The major of your faith is salat. If you pass the salat, pass this test, then other subjects are not very important. You're going to pass them. But if you do not pass this important test, if your salat is rejected by Allah, then your charity is not going to be accepted. Then your hajj is not going to be accepted in qubilat according to Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alihi wa sallam. In qubilat qubila ma siwaha wa in ruddat rudda ma siwaha. Communication with Allah. However, sometimes, and this is a common phenomenon, not among the youth, but even most of the adults feel this, that their prayers is tasteless, spiritless, sometimes meaningless. It's boring. They don't benefit from it. They do pray, but there is no outcome. There is no reward. What is the problem here? Does that mean the salat is not an effective tool of communication with God? There is something wrong with the salat itself, with the prayers itself, or the way we do the salat, the way we perform the salat is not right. We don't have the right approach to God. Obviously, it's the second one. Salat is the sole mean of salvation. As-salatu mi'rajul mu'min. As-salat is a way of elevating yourself and reaching the highest position and the highest altitude. Mi'rajul mu'min. Mi'raj means ascension. Ascension to God. To sublimity. This is the salat. There is nothing wrong with the salat. The wrong is with us. We do not pay enough attention to our prayers we take it very lightly we don't understand the meaning of the salat we neglect the salat this is the problem this is why we don't enjoy it this is why it's very boring for some of you and some of us too we are forced to pray because we want to appease and please our parents our friends so what do we do here to make the salat an interesting experience for us? What is the solution? Let's go through four requirements. There are certain conditions. If we can achieve them, then the salat will be a very beautiful, exciting experience in our life. You're going to enjoy it. You have to prepare these Prerequisites, these conditions, shurut salat adab salat the manners of the prayers. If we observe them, we will enjoy the prayers, brothers and sisters. The first condition is khushu, reverence, submissiveness, humility before God. 
when Allah speaks about the main features of the true believers, Allah says in chapter 23, Surah Al-Mu'minun. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Qad aflah al-Mu'minun al-ladhina hum fi salatihim khashi'oon. Indeed, this group of believers who humbled themselves in their prayers to God are going to be successful. قَدْ أَفْلَحَ الْمُؤْمِنُونَ Indeed, successful are those people who observe the khushu' submissiveness, devoutness, khushu' reverence to God. If we observe khushu' then you're going to enjoy the salat. How do we observe the khushu' Khushu' does not come at the time of the prayers, brothers and sisters. It comes before the prayers. Meaning that if you are engaged in falsehood, and this is what Allah says in the Quran, قَدْ أَفْلَحَ الْمُؤْمِنُونَ الَّذِينَ هُمْ فِي صَلَاتِهِمْ خَاشِعُونَ Followed by وَالَّذِينَ هُمْ عَنِ اللَّغْوِ مُعْرِضُونَ These two verses are interrelated with each other. Interrelated. Meaning that if وَالَّذِينَ هُمْ عَنِ اللَّغْوِ مُعْرِضُونَ If, if a believer avoids the cheap talks, the vain talks, the falsehood, lagu, the rumors, the tail bearing, the back biting, the slander and the accusation. These are the cheap talks, lagu, falsehood, futility. If you avoid them, you're going to enjoy your salat. You're going to achieve khushu' and reverence in your salat. Because you cannot switch. Imagine a person who is involved in cursing and swearing and profanity most of his time. And then the time for salat comes and he wants to stand before God and say Allahu Akbar. And he wants to, to have khushu' in his salat. This would never happen. There is, not, there is no electronic button that you can press changing it from faithlessness into being a faithful person. Prophet Muhammad did not bring us such a button here. Allahumma salli ala Muhammadin wa ali Muhammad. However, you have to prepare for the salat. Prepare your soul, your mind. Salat needs preparedness, preparation for the salat. You have to keep your soul and your mind clean, your mouth clean. If someone is engaged in flirtation most of his time, either on the keyboard or the phone, and then the time for salat comes at 5 a.m., he says, now it's time for my Lord. Five hours ago, I, was, I spent my time with my girlfriend or another strange lady, flirting with her, saying bad things to her. Now I want to concentrate on my Lord. It would never happen. You have to keep yourself, because your mouth, when I say something bad, my mouth, my tongue becomes contaminated. Contaminated means does not have the ability to communicate with the pure. Allah is a pure. And nothing reaches him except the pure. So we have to prepare. Prepare your mouth, prepare yourself. Again, if you are engaged in listening most of your time to provo provocative musics and songs, and then suddenly you want to switch to faith and salat and Quran, you cannot do that. You will pray, but you would never enjoy the prayers. Because the shaitan has infiltrated your mind by these provocative, seductive songs. It would not let you focus on Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Brothers and sisters, we have to prepare. Prepare our souls for the salat. The same thing, avoid eating the haram. Aklul haram. Eating something unlawful. Unlawful haram. Something which is not slaughtered according to Islamic faith, Islamic sharia. Ah. Allah says, Ya ayyuhal rusul, kulu min al-tayyibati wa'amalu salihah. In order for you to do good deeds, achieve good results, your food has to be lawful, pure, halal. If you bring a haram bite inside your stomach, 
it will contaminate your soul because we believe that food is not only for physical nourishment it's also for spiritual nourishment it would affect your soul not only your heart or your body the food that you eat affects your soul and your mind and therefore it's going to affect your deeds this is the hadith of our beloved Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam لقمة حرام واحدة تمنع الدعاء تمنع استجابة الدعاء وقبول الصلاة لأربعين يوما for 40 days imagine one single and lawful bite of something which is haram you go to a chain restaurant for instance I don't want to mention names I don't want them to sue me today go to them and eat something haram and lawful you think that's it nothing it goes to my stomach and it will leave my body no the evil will stay in your body for 40 days and as a result of that your prayers is not going to be accepted your dua when you petition to Allah is not going to be accepted Allah says to Musa ya Musa qul li zalamati bani Israel لا تدعوني والسحت في بطونكم O Musa, say to your community Tell them, do not pray to me while you carry a lawful food in your stomach Your prayers are not going to be accepted I'm not going to listen to your prayers Purify your stomach Your income, when you have income Your income has to be pure the food has to be pure. This is why, as a humble friend of you, I urge you, especially the youth here, don't eat outside your house. If you have a good mother who cooks good food for you, try to eat at home. Restrict yourself to the halal food. You never know what happens outside. You never know about the source of that food, whether that meat has been slaughtered according to Islam or Buddhism, for instance. You never know. Try to eat at home. Try to bring halal food inside your mouth and your stomach because it is going to affect your deeds. So, to bring about khushu', we have to prepare for that. One day, Amir al-Mu'mineen, alayhi salatu wasalam, the commander of the faithfuls, Imam Ali, he came inside the masjid and he saw a man standing for a prayers but he was not focusing his attention on the prayers. He was turning right and left. He was playing with his beards. He was not stable in his prayers. Imam turned to him and said, Ama annahu law qalbuhu la jawarihu. If his heart and his soul are devout, they incorporate reverence to God, then his limbs will also follow him. But since the heart is absent, he has lack of concentration. He is not focusing his, intent, his attention on Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He's somewhere else. He doesn't have hudur al-qalb, heart presence. He's absent-minded. Therefore, he doesn't pay attention. He plays right and left. This is not the way you stand before your Lord, brothers and sisters. Imam Zainul Abidin, alayhi salam. When the time for the prayers come, he starts shivering and shaking and his color constantly changes. He becomes pale. He becomes confused, perplexed. His family members ask him, what's the matter, Ya Ibn Rasulullah? What's wrong? What's happening to you? He says, Atadruna bayna yaday man uridu an aqif? Do you ever know that in front of whom I am going to stand, Uridu an aqifa bayna yaday jabbar as samawati wal ard. Do not blame me. I'm standing before the Almighty, the omnipotent of the heavens and the earth, Allah. Why some people the prayers for them is not very exciting? Why? Because they do not recognize Allah. They do pray. 
but with no recognition to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. They don't understand him. Therefore, they don't enjoy him. They don't have reverence in their prayers. Listen to the Quran. إِنَّمَا يَخْشَ اللَّهَ مِنْ عِبَادِهِ الْعُلَمَاءُ The only group of people who fear God and they have reverence for him in their souls and hearts and minds are the community of the scholars, the learned ones. Why? Because they recognize Allah. And the first step into faith is to recognize recognizing your Lord if you do not recognize him if you do not understand his stature and his importance you cannot converse with him and if you converse with him you cannot you are not going to enjoy the conversation with him Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam will go to the cave away from the people sometimes for 30 days climbs the mountain, goes to Ghar Hara, the cave of Hara, only by himself, lonely, no one with him, with little food and little bring, uh, drink, for many, many days by himself, in solitude, lonely. But that was the most beautiful experience for him, because he was with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. In that sanctuary with Allah, he had a seclusion with Allah, away from the glamour of the life, the enjoyment of the life. Because he recognizes Allah. الَّذِينَ يَذْكُرُونَ اللَّهَ قِيَامًا وَقُعُودًا وَعَلَى جُنُوبِهِمْ Imam Ali is the same. Imam Ali, after his martyrdom, one of his disciples describes him as the following. He said, كان يستوحش من الدنيا وزهرتها ويستأنس بالليل ووحشته. He feels estrangements with the glamour of the life, with the attractions of the life. He would not feel safe with it. يستوحش ويستأنس, but he enjoys the darkness and the loneliness and the alienation of the night. ويستأنس بالليل ووحشته. Why? Because the night is an opportunity for him to converse with Allah. Ilahi habni kamal al inqita'i ilayk. Kamal al inqita'. Total exclusive occupancy with you. I want you to occupy my heart with your glory. Enlight my heart. Those people will enjoy the salat. Imam Zain al Abidin will spend many, many hours a night, every night every night to stand in communion intimate intimate discourse with his lord and he would not get bored he would not get tired as i mentioned to you allah says to the prophet he would stand the whole night Taha ma anzalna those people understand allah and they enjoy the conversation with him have you heard the story of the man who fall in love with that lady, the lady's name is Gauhar Shad. She built a mosque in the city of Mashhad. The mosque does exist today. Those of you who are familiar with that city, they know what I am talking about. This beautiful mosque was built by a princess and the royal family, the daughter of the king of that time, who was young, single, and very attractive. She decided to build this mosque by herself. And when the mosque was finished, she came to inaugurate that place. But she decided to go by her own self, with no one with her. She said, I just want to be in that place with my Lord. No one around me, no aides, no guards, no followers. This is my condition. The first day I go and see the mosque, I have to be by myself. So she's a princess and they have to listen to her. So they announced that tomorrow all the people here have to vacate the mosque and leave. Because she wants to put her veil aside. She doesn't want to wear the hijab. She wants to appear just as she is, without any hijab, without any veil. 
she wants to sit and meditate inside the mosque by herself no male no females no one should be there so they decided to leave the place except one man who was a layman a builder who was working on the construction he was single and he did not have the opportunity to see the daughters the 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 king's daughter there were no tv at that time no newspapers no paparazzi you know so he wanted to see her and that was the only opportunity for him so he decided to stay but to hide she came the following day in the morning and she entered she was strolling and looking and watching and this very magnificent architect and the man was hiding behind you know some carpets there he was standing and watching her without she realizing that he is there he looked at her she was very beautiful he was blown away by her beauty he fell in love with her love from the first sight have you heard of that love from the first sight it happened there so she did her prayers she was alone she doesn't know that there is a man watching her and she left and the man immediately left after that they did not notice him he went home he had only a mother he used to live with his mother he went home very bewildered confused he did not eat anything that night he went to bed but he had a sleepless night he could not sleep the night the following morning he could not eat he did not talk he did not do anything he did not feel going back to work his mother noticed that she came to him son what's wrong with you are you sick he said no I'm physically okay so what's the matter then he told the story to his mother mother I saw her last night who is she a princess the one who built this beautiful masjid I am obsessed by her infatuated by her beauty so please help help me she said son you have nothing you are homeless shelterless foodless you have no future what do you mean help me he said but you go and do help try your best go to her father please speak to him on my behalf when the mother could not convince her son she decided to go to the king to travel and meet with her father and propose to her to that princess for her only son so she went to the king and she had to stay in line or according to the Brits in, in a queue she had to stand in a queue to meet with him and when her turn came she went and he was sitting among his advisors and aides and in, in the courtyard and she said to him I have an important request can you fulfill it for me he said sure yes what is it she said my son fall in love with your daughter so I came to propose to her would you accept that they all went in silence no answer she said this and she just stood the aides were looking at him and her and they anticipated a very violent reaction by him he nodded his head and raised his head again and said to her yes I accept really yes I am serious but I have one condition I have one condition here if he can fulfill this condition for me she will be his wife what is it the mother thought he's going to ask for millions of golden coins and silver and this and that and he said 
if your son from tonight by the time you go home go and tell him the king conveys his regard to you and he wants you to begin Salatul Layl from tonight for 40 nights 40 nights without any interruption every single night stand for Salatul Layl and spend no less than one hour in a prayers with Allah at the end of that period if you do all the 40 nights without any shortages then come to me and take my daughter and go to your house the mother was so thrilled salat al-layl piece of cake easy she rushed back home the son was waiting waiting for his mother's arrival when she came she said to him son good news that's it you're going to marry her are you sure really yes but you have to start performing Salat al-Layl every night for 40 nights he did not understand what's the connection between marriage and Salat al-Layl she said to him this is the request of the king and he gave me his word and he's going to honor it because he was sitting among his ministers and his aides so he decided to begin Salat al-Layl and since he didn't do it before this is the first time for him he went to a local sheikh in the masjid he asked him the order for Salat al-Layl he taught him how to do Salat al-Layl he came the first night his mother came to help him to wake him up for Salat al-Layl because he will go into deep sleep as some people do you know they sleep for 25 hours a day so she woke him up for Salat al-Layl and he begins praying the first night it was difficult for him it was really difficult for him bow and prostrate and stand and go and do al-afu 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 and mention this and mention that but he had to do that because he's he's waiting for a good reward it's worth it the second night he night he did it again the third the fourth the first week the second week without any interruption until the 40 days were over and the king was waiting for that lady to came to him to come to him and you know begin the process of engagement and marriage and whatever so she didn't come she didn't show up nobody came first day second day third day nobody there the king was worried where is she she's embarrassing me here she's not coming did he change his mind when she didn't come the king sent someone to her house bringing a letter of invitation to the courtyard that the king is waiting for you and you have to come so she went the king said why you are not here she said but my son did not ask me for anything where is he go and bring him the mother came back toddled back to her home and she met with the son she said son do you know that the 40 days are over and now you are entitled to marry the one that you love he said I do yes it's over but mother the day I asked you I had this crazy request from you at that time my heart was empty I had nothing I suffered emptiness spiritual emptiness I was lonely I felt I am lonely alone I had no one to talk to you but today I found a very good friend very nice loyal friend and I am talking to him every night and he is responding to me I am enjoying his conversation and this is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala my heart is full now and I really I don't need I don't feel the need for anyone else 
So please, mother, go back to his majesty and tell him that my son apologizes to you. He found the friend that he is looking for. He found the companion and the partner that he has been looking for for a long time. This is a true story, brothers and sisters. This is not a Hollywood movie. This is a true story. Allah filled the emptiness in his heart. Now, I'm not asking you not to get married and keep doing Salat al-Layl every night. No. No. I want you to get married soon. And I am seeing some brothers and sisters here. We have to push them. We have to encourage them. Sometimes we have to force them, inshallah. We have ways of forcing them to go and establish their life, their permanent life, inshallah. And nothing better than getting married, married in Islam, brothers and sisters. If we are about to achieve a good Muslim society, we have to encourage our brothers and sisters to get married. And this is what the Prophet did. The Prophet, when he emigrated from Mecca to Medina, the first thing he did to build the mosque, and the second thing is to facilitate marriage for the Muslim community. But Allah is important. And even if you get married, your marriage has to be for the sake of Allah. Your love for your wife, for your husband, for your children has to be dedicated for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Even the marriage has to be dedicated for Allah. Raising family is part of the love and service to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So, as salat, that is the first condition. Khushu' and reverence in the salat. The second is to approach the salat with full energy and excitement. With full energy. Full enthusiasm. Brothers and sisters, you have seen some people when they are promised to be taken to the Disney World or Euro Disney or Disneyland. They can't sleep the nights. They start counting. I have a three days left, two days left, one day left. The morning of the travel, you know, he can't wait until he gets into the car, the airplane, and reaches his paradise, his final destination. He goes with full energy. Sometimes people are so energetic that they cannot eat. They cannot, they lose their appetite. You have seen in the school sometimes two types of students. One of them, upbeat, bright, energetic, goes to the school and the school for him is, is fun, excitement. And we have seen others that going to school for them is the worst experience in their life. They are sleepy, lazy, you know, don't pay attention, they don't want to go to school. What is the difference between the first and the second? The first, he realizes the value of knowledge. He gets excited. School for him is important. It's the priority in his life. The second one does not understand the value of knowledge. And therefore, brothers and sisters, therefore, even sometimes when you are hungry, when you are hungry, you eat the food with appetite. When you smell the good, good food, you wait for the food. You eat it without any delay. But sometimes they put the same food, which is very tasty, in front of you. You don't have any appetite. Why? Because you are physically sick. There is a virus in your stomach. The food is the same food, but you lost your appetite. So you don't have that sort of excitement. Because there is a virus in the stomach. And if you don't get rid of that virus, you still would not love the food. Sometimes we have virus in the stomach and sometimes we have the virus where? In the heart, in the soul. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says about the hypocrites, the munafiqeen, fi qulubihim marad, fazadahum allahu marada. Can I ask you please just to stand up? and move a few, just a few 
Shall I say feet or yards or steps? Inshallah. Sallu ala Muhammad wa ali Muhammad. صلوا على محمد وآل محمد الله سبحانه وتعالى says about the منافقين إن المنافقين يخادعون الله وهو خادعهم وإذا قاموا إلى الصلاة قاموا كسالا يراؤون الناس the hypocrites they think they are overreaching God but they are not in fact. They are the losers. And when they stand, when the time for the prayers come and they stand, they stand for prayers, they, are, they stand sluggishly and lazily. They are not sincere in their standing. Tired, bored, have no time for the salat because they have sickness in their hearts. When someone is overwhelmed with sins, would never enjoy the prayers. Learn these rules, brothers and sisters. If you are involved in a sin and you don't rush to repentance and the sin stays in your heart, it will affect your prayers. You would never enjoy the prayers or the munajat or communication with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So this is the second. The first is khushu. The second is excitement and energy, full energy. And the third one is ikhlas. The hadith says, لَيْسَتَ الصَّلَاةُ قِيَامُكَ وَقُعُودُكَ وَإِنَّمَ الصَّلَاةُ إِخْلَاصُكَ The true spirit of the prayers is not bowing and prostration. The true spirit and the true value of the Salat, the essence of the Salat, is your sincerity, earnestness, ikhlas. This is the spirit of the Salat. Because we have an outer and inner dimension to the Salat. The outer one is the ruku and sujood, qiyam and qurud, standing, bowing, prostration. This is the outer, external dimension. But the internal dimension and the inner and the essence of the Salat is the spirit of Salat, the spirit of Ikhlas. You are doing that only and only and only for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. This is what we say. What do we say before we begin the Salat? What do we say before we say Allahu Akbar? Huh? What do we say? What is the requirement? Before you raise your hand and say Allahu Akbar, what do you say? The niyyah, the intention. I am doing this only and only for Allah, not for someone else. Ikhlas. It's dedicated only for Him, not for someone else. And the Salat, the Riyah, showing off during the Salat, if you show off to please someone who's standing next to you, is going to invalidate your prayers. There is each and every, for each and every type of worshipping in Islam, there is a certain virus which invalidates that worshipping. For instance, Afatul Ibadatil Ujb, the virus of the worshipping and the service to Allah is arrogance, self conceit, and a pride. If you think, oh, I'm doing too much of prayers, I'm becoming a holy person, a saint. Look at the amount of charity I paid. How many times I've been to Hajj? Many times. So I'm the best person. This is self-conceit. You are going to destroy your worship. The worshiping is supposed to make you humble, not arrogant. Not to show off. This is one. And for the charity, you may give the charity and donation, but you might destroy it later on. How? By minna. The reminder of the favor, meaning that you give, you help someone, you give him some money today, 
tomorrow you come to him and tell him, remember last night you had no money in your pocket. I was the only one who gave you the money, huh? Say thank you to me, huh? Don't forget that. Go and tell your wife. Remember last week you were homeless and I housed you in my house. You had no food. Remember you came to this country, you had no one. I was the only one who embraced you, who helped you. This is minna. لا تبطلوا صدقاتكم بالمن والأذى. All the community of the believers, do not destroy your charity, your good deeds, your benevolent deeds by putting a favor on the people and just reminding them all the time that I was the one. Otherwise, you would have been perished. I was the one who stood for you, who supported you, who brought you, who raised you. Don't do this. You are doing that for the sake of Allah, not for your own reputation. So this is the Salat here. If, if we want to keep the Salat safe, we have to maintain the spirit of sincerity, ikhlas, earnestness in the Salat. Ikhlas. And last but not least, because we have to conclude. What is also required for the good Salat to be accepted, to be enjoyed? To entertain your soul. Again, you need to do something else. I mentioned so far khushu, and I mentioned what? Enthusiasm for the salat, and I mentioned sincerity, and I'm going to mention awareness. Why? Why? Awareness, understanding. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, My words are well taken by only those who have awareness. Understanding, you understand. Because khushu is related to the spirit, spiritual act, khushu, reverence. While wa'i and awareness is an intellectual act, you understand what you say. See how many times a day we ask Allah this specific question. How many times? How many times you say that? Hmm? How many times? Ten? More than ten. How many prayers we have? Five. How many rak'ah we have? Seventeen. So at least you say it, at least you say it seventeen times a day. Oh my Lord, guide me to the right path, path, straight path. But at the end of the Salat, we don't follow what we say. We do not concentrate because we do not deep, we do not dive deep into the meaning of the prayers. The Salat, brothers and sisters, involves tahleel, tasbih, tahmeed, takbir, glorification, sanctification, adoration, Praise to Allah. We have to understand their meaning. For each and every saying, there is a deep meaning. Subhana Rabbi al Azimi wa bihamdih. Subhana Rabbi al A'la wa bihamdih. There is a meaning. There is a philosophy for that. We have to understand it. I will just tell you about the meaning of Allahu Akbar and I conclude. What is the meaning of Allahu Akbar? See how many times we say Allahu Akbar? What is it? Can someone tell me here? If you know the real meaning, huh? Otherwise, you have to pay a hefty penalty. What is the meaning of Allahu Akbar? One day, one day, I don't want you to pay penalties tonight. One day, a person was sitting next to Al Imam al Sadiq. He said, Allahu Akbar, God is the greatest. Imam turned to him, he said, God the greatest? He said, Yes. Greater than whom? He said, Oh. Ibn Rasulullah, greater than everything in this world. Imam said, Laqad haddattah. You have constrained God. You have bounded him, limited him, restricted him when you said, He is greater than everything. Why? Because you have compared him against other creatures. When I say this person is bigger than that person, I am comparing him to that person. And we cannot compare Allah to anything in this universe. So the man said then, what is the meaning of Allahu Akbar? 
The Imam said to him, Allahu Akbar min an yusaf. He is too great to be conceived, to be imagined, to be envisaged. This is the meaning of Allahu Akbar. Too great to be understood. Imam Ali alayhi salam says, ما رأيت شيئا إلا ورأيت الله قبله وبعده ومعه is the one who sees Allah all the time, all the time, throughout the journey of his life. And this is what Ashab al Hussein did, in particular Al Abbas alayhi salam. On the night of Ashura, the last night in Imam's life, the very last night, Imam alayhi salam sends chooses his brother Al-Abbas as a delegate and sends him to the camp of Umar ibn Sa'd to ask him not to invade Imam Hussein's camp on that night, to delay it, give them a respite for tomorrow. ركعات فإن ربي يعلم أنني لا زلت أحب الصلاة وتلاوة القرآن. Go my brother Abbas, my life would be your ransom. روحي لك الفداء. Go and tell them, have this request to delay the invasion, the attack, so we can spend the night. Tonight is our last night in this lower world. Let's. Spend the night in sanctification, adoration of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So Abbas went there and Umar ibn Sa'd said, the request is granted. You may pray as much as you want to pray. وَبَاتَ الْحُسَيْنُ وَأَصْحَابُهُ تِلْكَ اللَّيْلَةِ مَا بَيْنَ قَائِمٍ وَقَاعِدٍ وَرَاكِعٍ وَسَاجِدٍ وَتَالٍ لِلْقُرْآنِ They spent the whole night the whole night. Imagine tomorrow you have an important interview for a new job, for a new school, for a new university. You would never sleep the night before. Imam Hussein is having an interview with his Lord, the ultimate interview, the ultimate meeting with Allah. He did not spend the night snoring in his bed. He was standing, sitting, prostrating, bowing to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and reciting the Holy Quran. Al-Abbas was one of the leaders there who kept the camp safe. Al-Abbas had this wonderful quality that when he was present there, all women, Zainab alayhi salam, the rest of the Hashimiyat, the rest of the progeny and the household of Imam Hussein would feel safe and secure since Abbas the standard bearer is there among them. He's the hero. Al-Imam Zayn al-Abideen alayhi salam says, رحم الله عمي العباس فلقد آثر وأبلى وواسى أخاه بنفسه حتى قطعت يده. May God bestow his mercy on my uncle al-Abbas because he sacrificed his soul. He passed the test. And he stood in solidarity with his brother, Imam al Hussein until he lost his arms. But listen to the reward from Allah. وَإِنَّ لِلْعَبَّاسِ لَدَرَجَةً فِي الْجَنَّةِ يَغْبِطُهُ بِهَا جَمِيعُ الشُّهَدَانِ Beautiful reward. Allah gave him two green wings where he can fly in paradise from one place to another place. And all the martyrs tomorrow are going to envy him for having such a beautiful wings in paradise. Al-Abbas was a hero, was an asset to Imam Hussein alayhi salam. On the eve of Ashura, it was dark, totally dark. Imam Abbas alayhi salam was guarding the camp 
moving from one position into another, suddenly he saw a dark, someone walking in the dark. He shouted, Man hada? Who's there? A female voice came to him, Ana Uhtuka Zainab. Don't worry. I'm your sister, beloved sister Zainab here. Sister, why you are here? What's happening? You are supposed to be inside the tent with the kids. Why you are standing outside? She said, My dear brother, I came out to share a very intimate and important story with you. I want to tell you this story. I haven't told you this story before. I kept it until this night. So do you have time to listen to me? He said, sure, of course. Yes, haddithini faqad hala waqtul hadith. This is the time I want to enjoy your voice, Zainab. You know how you, you are so dear to me and beloved to my heart. So yes, yes, I want to hear the story. He disembarked from his horse. He came close to her. They stood in the dark. She said to him, Akhi, I want to take you 50 years back when our beloved mother Fatima died. We were still very young. Lama matat ummuna Fatima. Hazuna abu alayha abuna amirul mu'mineen huznan shadeedan. Our father was deeply saddened and distressed by her loss. And after a while, he summoned his brother Aqil. He said to him, Ya Aqil, اخطب لمرأة ولدتها الفحولة من العرب. I want you to go and search within the Arab tribes and propose on my behalf to a lady that is born in a household, in a family of a bravery and magnanimity. فقال عقيل وما تصنع بها؟ O Amir al-Mu'mineen, what are you going to do? Why she should be very brave? He said to him, لأرزق منها ولدا أدخره ليوم الشدة. So I can receive from her a boy, a son, that I can keep him for the time of distress, for the time of emergency. I need that boy to help my son Hussein. Ya Aqi, I am planning for the future. Then Zainab holds the hand of Abbas and says to him, Ya Abel Fad, Akhi Abel Fad, you have been meant and made for this day. You have been preordained for this day. Akhi Abel Fad, Al Banatu Banatuk, Wal Akhawatu Akhawatuk. والحلائل حلائل أخيك فلا تقصر في نصرة أخيك الحسين عناج عناج لا يصفر لونيك والله لخبص الكون دونك This is what he answers her عناج لا يصفر لونيك أنا والله لخبص الكون دونك وش حدهم يا زينب يوصلونك ابن والدك قرت عيونك After that on the following day on the day of عاشوراء العباس عليه السلام when he saw that his brother become increasingly beleaguered and the cries of the thirsty children, the screaming of women filled his ears. He came, he stood in front of his brother, Al Hussein alayhi salam, seeking his permission. Imam Hussein did not want to part with his brother since he was an important asset in his camp. He said to him, Akhi, Akhi, Ida dahabt tafarraq liwa'i. If you go, my army will be dispersed. I have no one to keep it united together. I want you to stay with me. I don't want you to leave my camp and my army. So Al-Abbas insisted on him. He said, 
سيدي أبا عبد الله لقد ضاق صدري وأريد أن أخذ ثاري من هؤلاء المنافقين Allow me I am tired of those people I cannot stand any more screams The kids are crying and screaming العطش العطش We are thirsty thirsty We need help So, so let me go At that moment Imam Hussein gave him permission gave him permission to go and bring some water for the kids. So he took the skin container, he went with it, they gathered around him, the whole army gathered around Abbas, they surrounded him, he did not fear them, he made them flee the scene, and he managed to reach the water line of the Euphrates. He went there, Al-Abbas alayhi salam, successfully managed to reach the banks of the river. When he stood there, thirst took a toll on him. He was so thirsty and so tired. He stretched his hand, he puts his hand in the water. He picks a handful of water to drink. Immediately he remembered that he came here, he promised the kids and women to bring them some drink and he should not drink before his brother, beloved brother Hussein, and the rest of the family. So he threw the water away. Ya nafsu min ba'd al-Husayn huni wa ba'dahu hawlaka ana ayyan takuni هذا الحسين وارد المنون وتشربين بارد المعين الله ما هذا فعال ديني ولا فعال صادق اليقين ضاق الماي بس هيس ببردة ترس شفة يروي عطش شبدة تذكر لن أخوه حسين بعد بعد ذب الماي من شفة وتحسر ينادي أنا شراب لذيذ الماي حاشة حاشة وهلي قضوا كلهم عطاشة رمى الماء من يده he decided to go back so he filled the container and he mounted his horse and with all the enthusiasm he went towards the camp of Imam Hussein alayhi salam but they again gathered around him he was fighting very courageously one of the men one of the enemies he waited, he laid in waiting for him beneath, underneath a tree there or behind the tree there when Al-Abbas was fighting. He strikes Al-Abbas on his right arm, he severs the right arm. Wallahi in yameeni إني أحامي أبدا عن ديني وعن إمام صادق اليقين نجل النبي الطاهر الأمين Again they gathered around him he was fighting he tried to protect the container to get the water sa safe to the camp. Another man was waiting for him. He strikes him on his left arm. He severs the left arm. Allahu Akbar. Qata'u yisarah wa qafal abbasu mutahayiran. He lost his two arms. He didn't know what to do. While he was standing there, another man, another criminal from the army approached him. And he strikes him with a pole on his skull. He crushes his skull. Allahu Akbar. Aina al-Munadi wa Abbasa wa Sayyidah. Fahara ila al-Ard. He falls to the ground. 
As soon as he falls to the ground, he shouts, Abad Akhah, Akhah, Alayka Minni Salaam, Aba Abdullah. This is the first time he addresses Imam Hussein with this name. He says, Akhi Hussein, for the rest of his life, 33 years, he never mentioned the name Hussein. But this now, he wanted to be very intimate, very close to his brother. Nada, Akhi Hussein, Adrikni. I have no one other than you at this moment to come, to rush to me, to save me. Aqbala ilayhi al Hussein. He found him armless, has no arms. His forehead was ruptured, his skull was crushed, an arrow embedded into his eyes. His face was covered with dust and blood. He bends on him, Akhi, Akhi, Al-An in Kasara Bahri. Now my backbone has been destroyed and broken. I have no way out of this. Now my enemies are rejoicing at my misfortune. At Imam Hussein, a few minutes later, he stood. He was despondent, despaired, weeping, weeping and going back to the camp, the first one who noticed him coming alone, his sister, his sister Zainab, saw her brother coming alone from that site. She rushed outside. Dear Hussein, Habibi Hussein, where is Abel Fahl? You are coming back again, where is he? Allahu Akbar, nadat wa abbasa wa akha. Oh my dear beloved Abbas, what a tragic loss after you. عداكم عقبكم لفولينا وحرقة وخيمنا ومبانينا يا وحرقة وخيمنا ومبايا يا يا عانينا يا العباس يعتذر هي apologizes to his sister زينب يخت العذر لله وليت لأصاب السهم عيني وفقد عن نهر إسراي يختي وفقد يميني ذاك الوقت يا زينب أريد أن تعذريني لو طحت مرمع للنهر مخي يبت حيدر لثر عمد الحديد بكربلا يا خسف القمر من هاشم فلتبكي عن يا نظر او ما رايت عن سرجه العباس خر فمشى إليه السبط يا ينعاه كسار تلعان ظهري يا أخي ومعيني